Good morning, and thank you for being here. I, I really would like to thank um, the museum and Margaret Miller for inviting me, as well as Noel Smith, for the opportunity uh, to talk about Carlos's work. Um, it's, you know, when you work with an artist um, as a curator, and uh, you do that on a regular basis, especially in contemporary art, you're working with living artists, you try to keep in touch with the artist once you've worked on the exhibition, and the exhibition either ends, you know, after two or three months, or goes on to tour to other museums, you remain connected to the artist, but as years go by, and you're working with other art artists, you know, they get replaced. And you, as a curator, try to stay in touch with the artist and stay up to date on the work. And sometimes it is easy, and sometimes it's more difficult, because nowadays, artists are traveling a tremendous amount of, uh, and are also exhibiting a lot, so trying to keep up with what they do, it's a, it's a, it's a task, you know, it's sometimes a full-time task. And, and I think that artists like Carlos, who have gone on to extremely successful uh, careers, you know, it's, um, it's really exciting to see what they have done, especially if you have shown them or worked with them early on when it was more of a risk taking opportunity, you didn't know how the artist was going to proceed in his or her career, but you, you found the work interesting, you found it challenging, you found it exciting, and you felt that the artist deserved an opportunity. Um, and it was like playing the lottery, you know? Artists can go in different directions and they can become very successful and another sort of fade away. So with Carlos, of course, that hasn't happened. Uh, he's become extremely successful. Um, in the museum world, but as well uh, as in the commercial world, and, and it's widely collected internationally by museums and by private collectors, and, uh, and also keeping up with the work was something that this talk today gave me an opportunity to do, because Carlos is really good at sending emails about when he's showing or where he's showing, but sometimes he doesn't send images of the work, so you know, He's having all these exhibitions, but you don't know what he's showing. So, and this exhibition having been organized in Cuba, um, it's also very interesting because it's from a Cuban point of view, as opposed to the kind of perhaps perspective that I would take on Carlos's work or the kind of perspective that a European curator would. Uh, and although you know that for many of us who have worked with Cuban artists, one of the essential things is to have gone to Cuba, to have actually been in the country. And although, you know, we don't live there and any visit we make is really brief, um, a few days or a week or 10, you know, or two weeks, you have to be there to sort of understand where the artist comes from. Because the, the context from where the art comes from is, is quite unusual. And it's quite specific to Cuba. So to understand the art really well, you have to sort of experience a little bit of the daily life of the Cuban people and to sort of try to understand this very complex um, country they live in. You know, the, the Cuba is so small, but, but the complexity of its politics is so big. It's, it's gigantic. So I think that one of the reasons why we many of us um, continue to be engaged with Cuban art is that you never fully understand it. And you never fully understand the, politi the politics or the, you know, the, of the place, so you keep finding that things change on a daily basis. And I think that for artists, that also fuels the, their work. Um, the most successful Cuban artists are the ones who have stayed in the island, who have not emigrated completely to another place. Because I, I think that they do need the context uh, uh, that, that kind of specific context to the country to generate a work that is really, really interesting and engaging, and, and that's something that is lost once you leave. So I'm saying all this because I think that to understand where you know, the art comes from, you have to know about it, because the politics and daily life are so intertwined in Cuba, and they sort of permeate everything that everybody does there. So uh, to a certain extent, you know, you can't only look at the art from an artistic point of view. You have to look at it from, from other perspectives, and the political perspective is essential. 
Um, in terms of Carlos's work, I think that there are major themes, of course, you know, architecture being the first one, but his work is also tied to language and, of course, politics. So for me, those are the three columns upon which the work sort of, um, uh, the work is supported by. And this is something that you, you can actually see uh, when, when you look at the work. For example, the work, this, these light boxes that are all uh, along our very recent work by Carlos, and uh, they, of course, uh, have the three elements, you know, the architecture, the language, and the politics. And, and these are uh, empty billboards, you know, that there being no free market in Havana, you know, no one has the funds to advertise. And, and, and the only slogans that you see are slogans that I would imagine are placed on streets by the Communist Party. Uh, but these are old slogans that have repeated from the beginning of the revolution. And, uh, and so there's a lot of billboards that are empty and Carlos has taken that space that is kind of visible yet invisible and, and, and created this, this and superimposed language like this one that says, I cannot continue anymore. Um, and we don't know what it really means. I mean, what is this person referring to in particular, but it's something that resonates with everybody. Everybody who with time, you know, supported a revolution that never really completely worked and that many, many are, have become impatient about it, especially the younger generations who have seen the lives of their parents sort of, you know, um, sort of, you know, go by, be wasted uh, without opportunities and they don't want to do that anymore. They're waiting and waiting so they can also have their share especially in, in the kind of world we live in today with the technological advances and the internet and so on, they can see what they're missing. Uh, this, one, oh, this one again is the same thing with the word no, 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 I, you know, I can't continue anymore. Carlos has made many works with uh, words like this and some of it was taken from, um, from Russian, um, from Russian uh, t uh, typographical you know, styles. Um, and of course, the, the color red has a lot of meanings, and of course, red means communism. Uh, so that is also something that he uses um, in his works. Um, you can see the type of uh, the city a little bit. I don't know if these um, are recent photographs. I haven't spoken to Carlos, so I'm not so sure whether these are photos that he took now or some photos that he has accumulated. He, for many years, has made it uh, at, um, sort of a habit of, of taking walks throughout the city with a camera and photographing different views of the city and creating a photographic archive that he keeps, you know, and from time to time goes back to it and mines it for different uh, projects. So um, this could have been taken 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or they could have been taken a year ago. Um, but this form, you know, this very graphic form of, of projecting onto the houses um, and then having this, this kind of slogans, although not necessarily political slogans as we're used to, but this kind of very thoughtful uh, phrases um, that, that, that are very, you know, poetic, some are literary, some, so they transcend all the political uh, stuff that goes in Cuba every day. And the work that we have here, to me, is really fascinating because it's a work that I have, I'm seeing for the first time. I've seen photos of it, but it's a very recent work by Carlos, and to me, it kind of signals a shift in the work uh, somehow. And I don't know if this is transitional work, you know, that he's uh, making or whether this is the direction that he wants to go. But one of the interesting things about the work is that, um, well, it's very colorful. You know, his work has never been that colorful. It's, um, except for some, some uh, architectural models that he's made with color, but tends to be quite monochrome. He works with black and white photography. So all the photography that, that you've seen is black and white. And her, his um, architectural models are made with balsa wood. So, you know, they have, it has the color of the wood. 
Um, but this is quite colorful in, 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 its, um, in its palette. And also, another thing that's very interesting is the use of, of uh, imagery. Um, I don't remember ever seeing, for example, the image of a rat in his work. I mean, I've seen that in the work of other artists, but in Carlos's work, you know, or the, the figure. That's not something that I have seen in the work. Uh, you do see in some of the photos, as we're going to see in the other room, because those, uh, those are urban photographs, there's people in them, and it's usually passers-by, you know, people going to work or shopping or doing some kind of an activity. Uh, but in terms of using the figure as the subject, this is not something that, that I've seen before. Fingers or, for example, this looks like a, like a brain. Um, and, and so it's very interesting that, that the, and the graphic design, I mean, the graphic quality of the table is quite interesting uh, to me. Uh, so um, the fact that he's laying them out on a table, I think is very telling in, 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 in that it's like, um, it's like a working table. It's, it's a place where the artist can experiment, where the artist can lay down um, ideas you know, that he's working on, not knowing where exactly they are, these ideas are going to take him, you know, in what direction he's going to go. Um, utilizing materials he hasn't used before. And, and, and um, things like this, for example, this piece here with the syringes, you know, I've never seen him do anything related to, to drugs, you know, um, or, you know, or some other kind of social ill. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting on that, in that, in that sense, that, that he's um, doing this. And of course, Carlos began a while ago uh, to, um, to have assistants, to have other people assist him. And he's really put together this fantastic group of people who have stayed with him through the years and helped him create the art, because he's very time consuming. Um, another thing that's very interesting with Carlos's work is that as years have gone by, the finishing of the work, it's, it's, it's become amazing. I mean, everything is so pristine and so beautiful and so perfect, and he really takes care. And the reason why he can do that is actually because he has a studio in Spain. So he has a studio in Havana and one in Spain. You cannot find these materials in Havana. Everything that he does there has to be imported. And, but in, of course, in Spain, you know, he has uh, the world of materials. So the, the, the process that some artists have to go through, um, this idea of carrying materials from the outside to Cuba is something that, you know, it's, it's been part of the, the, the working process for the artists who have remained in the island, but who have the possibility of, of traveling abroad. You know, they, and that has created a lot of interesting and complex situations in that when the artists were allowed to uh, travel outside of the country and show internationally, and the work was acquired by museums or collectors, so they were able to set up bank accounts in places like Switzerland and Canada, and so they could keep the proceeds of the sales there and buy materials that they needed and take the materials back to Cuba so they could work in Cuba for six months or a year with the materials that they acquired and then create the works that would then be taken out again and exhibited in other places. So let's move into that uh, other gallery. This is an amazing, beautiful piece. Uh, it's, it's, I think he made it, I saw it two years, two years ago, I believe, or at, at an art fair in Miami. And, you know, as I said, Carlos's work is about architecture and literature and politics, and this is, of course, about power. And one of the interesting things about the work that Carlos is doing is that he started very local. The early work was all about Havana, about the city where he was born, and also the neighborhood where he grew up, Havana Vieja, the old Havana. So a lot of the early works, the drawings and the photographs were about that city that he loved so much. But as he became what we call a transnational artist, and he started showing outside of Cuba quite frequently, 
and also understanding the world, because when you live in Havana and you haven't been out of that place, that island, for 20, 25 years, you really don't understand how the world works. But once you do, and you start seeing other countries and other cultures, um, I think you have to change your vision of the world. And with Carlos, his work has gone from being local to being global, you know, from being um, uh, to be universal in a sense. And I think that has also helped him grow as an artist and, 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 and the appeal of the work has also increased because he speaks to us in a universal way. So we don't have to um, struggle to understand what he's trying to do. And, you know, a series of works that he started a few years ago are all about the world outside. They were about, they could be about Cuba, but they, they can also be about the rest of the world. And this is a piece, I think this is called the crown jewels. And here, you know, Carlos is equating these, these buildings that are built, built, that were built in different countries of the world as, you know, with, with the, the crown jewels, with jewels that could be in somebody's head. And, and, and they're made of silver. And he doesn't usually use this material for his works. It's very interesting that he's chosen silver. And these are a series of, of buildings that uh, symbolize repression and violence in different countries. Uh, buildings um, that were built for that purpose or buildings that were then taken temporarily for that purpose. Um, and these are some, for example, this is, this is Guantanamo. This is the, um, the prison of Guantanamo in Cuba. Uh, I think this is uh, Villa Marista, which was a seminary in Cuba, but it's a, it's, it's, a, um, it's a prison, you know, it's been a prison for many, many years. And you can see the repurposing, this is interesting, the repurposing of architecture, how a building was built for one purpose and then it's, you know, taken over and converted into something else. So a seminary to train Catholic priests become a prison where thousands and thousands of people have died and been tortured. Um, so we have Cuba, well here we of course have Cuba, but this is American territory, you know, the Americans are the ones who handle Guantanamo. We have a stadium, the National Stadium in Chile, where 40,000 people were in prison at one time, and a couple thousand were killed there, and a couple of other thousand people disappeared, and so these are places of pride for some countries for some governments, you know, places of violence and torture become also places that governments are proud of. And, and it's, it's a sad story, but it's, it's very interesting that as, you know, you would price a diamond or a pearl as something really valuable, these governments are, you know, sort of taking pride in these buildings that cause so much violence and, 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 and death and, and, and pain to so many people. Interesting enough, this work was shown in Cuba. And that brings another issue about how the government works there in the sense that they have a censorship. Of course, they know what you do, but sometimes they let you do things because it's important for them to support culture to a certain extent. And so artists like Carlos have a privileged existence uh, in that they are allowed to do things that perhaps someone else wouldn't. And because Carlos is such an international figure, that, that, that it brings a lot of attention to the country and, and it's a valuable member of society. And so he's allowed to push boundaries a little bit more than the regular Cubans, Cuban citizen. Um, I was told that when this exhibition opened in the Museum of Modern Art in, in Havana, there are two members of the secret police came to, uh, to see the exhibition, you know, and they talked to the curator about it and then they left. Uh, but you never know what's going to happen. The exhibition could have been closed. I've been in places where they do that. I've been in, in instances in Cuba when they actually close down the exhibition for hours or days until they, they deliberate, until they decide whether they should let it um, you know, happen or not. And this time they didn't do much, perhaps because it was done in the context of the Havana Biennial. And that's a very international um, event. You have uh, thousands of, of visitors from all over the world coming to see the biennial. So it would have been quite a scandal uh, to close the exhibition. But, but it was interesting that the government allowed this bit of, um, of, of, of um, critique, you know, about, about the, the government, um, the, how the government treats its citizens. 
Um, so there are more um, of the buildings here. Um, in addition to the buildings that we see here, this is the this is uh, the DGI in Havana, which is where there are three floors dedicated in this building to um, to actually uh, observe Cuban and U.S. relations. You know, this is where the offices are, offices that are always looking towards the United States. And I have to say that many of the things that go on between the U.S. and Cuba, we have no idea. But the, uh, the governments talk, um, talk daily. They really do, and they know everything that's going on. And, and so everything that happens between Cuba and the states, you know, may be a surprise to us, but it's not to them because they are on daily conversations and you see uh, Cuban officials with the New York Times on their desks sometimes, and it's like the day. It's not a week old, it's like the same day. So it's very interesting how the politics work in that respect. Um, this is the KGB in Moscow. Um, one interesting thing about this work is that um, this work is based on the internet. Um, as the internet developed, uh, of course, Cuba would not allow the internet. Um, but of course, you can fight against technology and there are certain things that are too strong to fight against. And so eventually the government allows certain people to have internet access, mostly to email. You know, and the email was an official site and all the email is supposedly read and censored. Um, but a lot of people, scholars and um, musicians and artists and perhaps, um, you know, the uh, academics and so on had access to email, not to anything else. As far as I knew, for many, many years, all they could do was email. But now some have access to the Internet. And although they supposedly the, 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 the information on the Internet is, is available and there's a lot of it, is not really true. Um, Cubans have access to some information on the internet, not all of it, not the way we do. And this uh, uh, project and the descriptions of each building, the purpose of each building is actually based on internet information, so it's very biased. You know, it's what the Cuban government wants you to know and to believe, but it's not necessarily the whole picture. And so, you know, it shows how the internet, how, how People can manipulate the information that you get on the internet. Um, let's move to the, last, um, to the last gallery. This is the stadium in Chile where, you know, during the repressive years of Pinochet, it became a place of torture. This is the Pentagon in, the, in Washington, D.C. Um, this is the Stasi in, West, in, in East Germany. And I think this little building here is the ESMA in Buenos Aires, which is the, the Naval um, Academy where a lot of people were tortured and disappeared during the Dirty War. And this idea of being visible and invisible is really interesting. It sort of speaks to the dichotomies that, that are so prevalent in Cuba. So all these buildings exist, but yet they seem to remain invisible in our consciousness. And they're large, they're prominent, but you know the, this, the, the, the fact that they, they are, are sites of secrecy sort of make them invisible to most of us on a regular basis. I think two years ago that Carlos presented it at the Venice Biennale in Venice, Italy. And um, one of the interesting things about Carlos's career also is that early on he was um, he was picked up by a gallery in Italy, uh, Galleria Continua, and this gallery was started by three guys, three close friends in a tiny town, San Gimignano, which is a very touristy town, but it's a it's a trek you to go there is not so easy. So it's interesting to see how this gallery, which actually had municipal support from the city of San Gimignano has expanded into an international enterprise. So the gallery started in this tiny little town, so if you wanna go there, it takes you a day to, to get there, be there, come back to wherever you, you are. <clears throat> and they have expanded. They have a place in France, again, not too very easy to reach, and they have a gallery in China, in Beijing. And this piece was originally made for China for the opening of Galeria Continua. 
uh, in Beijing, and in which Carlos did a huge exhibition, and some of it was based on, 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 on Chinese culture. Uh, it's called Bend City Red, and um, I always want to call it Folded City, because <laughs> I think it's, the, I, I feel like they misuse the language, but it happens a lot now in contemporary art, because English has become the lingua franca, and everybody in the world uses English for their titles, and not everybody knows the language well, so you find these really funny titles. But it's folded paper, and it's based on the Asian tradition of origami, you know, the Japanese tradition of folding paper into different shapes. And, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and then it's in the color red, you know, red for China, red for communism. And, and so again, he's using the color red, you know, to allude to a certain kind of, 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 of um, uh, philosophy. And here, you know, he has cut the paper into so many kind of architectonic styles. Some resemble buildings, some resemble sculpture. Um, interesting, he's not the only person who's done that. There is another artist, Marco Maggi from Uruguay, who's based in New York, who also cuts paper and creates these tiny little structures, but he does it with white paper, and the structures are so tiny that you really have to get very, very close to be able to look at them. And they, they are created in the same way. You cut the paper in different shapes, and then you flip it up to do a three-dimensional structure. Uh, but while, Carlo, or, while Marco Maggi's work is about preciousness and about really getting into this microcosm, Carlos is completely about uh, something else. Uh, and, and you see here all different kinds of buildings or sculptures. You know, some resemble minimal sculpture. I would say, oh, this one looks like a Richard Serra piece, perhaps. And some look like an archetypal kind of, um, of, of uh, architecture, there are, there's a piece there that looks very much like fascist architecture and so on. And, and it's a beautiful experiment in forms that, that he created. And um, I was astonished when he did this because uh, he hadn't used paper before. And I think it was the beginning of, of a new form, uh, experimenting with materials. Um, and this is something that he has done from the beginning in the works that you see behind you, all those photographs of, of different structures in Havana, in which he's fantasizing about what could be there instead of what it's there. You know, and you see, for example, a, a, a structure that seems to have been started but not continued and he tends to sometimes finish them. It's, it's also work about memory, you know. Uh, in some places, he uh, actually tries to replace what used to be there. Um, having taken photographs for a long period of time, you know, he has this great archive of, of buildings that don't exist anymore because they have basically fallen down. The buildings have been destroyed by the weather and by time and also by the lack of, of maintenance. And so here he's fantasizing about uh, what could be there. And like Noel and I were talking about this before, and she says sometimes he, you know, he gets uh, to play in, in funny ways with, um, with the images, like the image with the word arg. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm up to, I'm, I'm, I'm not patient anymore. Um, the, the photos in the back, uh, are quite interesting. Um, they, they play with the notion of nostalgia uh, in terms of, I think, what Cuba was before the revolution to a certain extent. They sort of hinted to what that city was. Uh, Havana is such an interesting place because, it, and, and an interesting stu a case study for architecture because if you go there, you can see architecture from the 16th century to 1965. And then there is a gap, and then a few modern structures that have gone up in the last few years. But for architects to have 500 years of architecture in one place, it's an incredible thing. And here you can see all these buildings um, that were built before the revolution, of course, before 1959, different uh, styles. Um, but they, they show a certain way of life, a certain style. The, 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 they must have been mostly shops and they had names, and the names were engraved on the floor. 
uh, you know, which of course, you know, speaks of permanence. You know, you put something on the floor, it's gonna stay there forever. It's part of the, the sidewalk and, and it's something that everybody's gonna see as they step, you know, into the, 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 the store. And the names they have, you know, the La Honradez, Honesty, you know, or La Isla, the island, uh, La Polaca, the Polish woman, uh, El Mundo, the world. And so this very evocative, sin rival, without rival. So, you know, they're very evocative in, 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 their, in their names and, and Carlos has, um, has added his own thoughts to that. For example, the photograph in which you say, be it, see the, wor the, 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 the words El Mundo, the world, then he adds to that, el país, the country, la casa, the house. So you go from the world to the country, to the house, to the neighborhood. So you go from the universal, the global, to the more intimate, you know? And, and um, it's, it's so interesting also to see them today and how this architecture has not been preserved for you know, different reasons and how these buildings are in such a state of decay that, that give the city this, this patina that it's, that it's fascinating, but it's also sad, it's, it's, it's frustrating. And, and, and in the sense that you're losing all this fantastic architecture and no one is doing much to preserve it. Um, and it's something that Cubans live with every day. You know, and, and when buildings fall down, you know, one day you have the building there and the next day you go by and it's an empty lot. And, and it stays like that. So I think that uh, it's, Carlos is, is in a way um, a recorder of time. You know, through his work, he's preserving also an image of the city that may not be there uh, in 10, 20, 30 years. And, 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 and how the city has evolved and changed and, and the different uses that buildings have. Um, the, the first photograph is really funny. The building is called the House of the Irons and um, the would you press, you know, you close with. And I guess that's all they sold in that business and he then uses pins and thread to create these flying irons. And he's been using pins and thread uh, to, um, in his work for a while now, you know, the fragility of both, the fragility of inserting pins onto a piece of paper and then tying thread and creating forms, be it architectural forms or letters, you know. Uh, it's, it's uh, again, you know, gives the, wor the work a sense of, of, of fragility, a sense of limitation in terms of time um, and how, you know, difficult it is to preserve something like that, as it is difficult to preserve something that looks a lot more permanent, like a building, you know? So the idea of permanence and impermanence runs very deep in his work, too. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. There is another work at the very entrance. Uh, I think we can go there. Uh, very interesting work that, that Carlos is doing now with books, too. And it's an offshoot of his interest in language. Um, I remember that initially he worked with uh, a writer in Havana, and the writer would write short stories based on Carlos's works. Um, and now, you know, uh, Carlos is not doing that anymore, but he's using language in his work in different ways and using language and architecture together. So why don't we go there and look at that last work? I had only seen this, this uh, work in photographs and I was really surprised at, the, um, at how delicate it is and how small it is in a certain way. Um, early on, Carlos had shown a photograph of a building in Havana that looks very much like the side of these. It's a building that has the round windows. Um, and so it's interesting that he goes back to that. You know, there is that reference there. Um, for many of you who are not familiar with the history of architecture in Latin America, um, Latin American countries were very excited about modernist architecture because they saw it as a sign of progress. And Le Corbusier visited Brazil and, and Argentina early on, and his books were widely read by architects. So there is amazing modernist architecture in places like Brazil and Argentina and Venezuela. And even smaller countries also have 
you know, wonderful examples of modern architecture from the 50s and 60s, especially the international style. And of course, you know, Havana is no different. They had a very strong community of architects who were very active and, and, and people were very interested in architecture. They really commissioned architects to build their homes, you know, and so um, nowadays, of course, it's really hard to, to see how, because the homes have mutated, they have been changed in some way, so the original homes don't exist anymore, and they, or they are not recognizable, but, but Havana has a, a strong history of architecture. There is even a Neutra house in Havana, I believe, which is actually, uh, I think it's, it was owned by a former um, ambassador of Switzerland. Um, in any case, this is a, a, a um, this work, uh, as other works that Carlos has made recently, um, making shelves uh, that resemble modernist buildings. Um, I think this building resembles a Corbusier, a Le Corbusier building, and, and his ideas of, of how these amazing buildings were to provide better lives to people when the Corbusier created his, his public housing, you know, his idea, he uh, designed the buildings in a way that they all would get the morning sun, the afternoon sun, enough light, the ventilation was very important, so he created a whole system of ventilation. So you wouldn't need to, to have air conditioning or um, also, you know, he thought of the roof as being a terrace, a, a, a community place where children could play and neighbors could chat and there could be this amazing social life in the building. The reality is that those buildings uh, are very depressing, you know, and as that model was copied around the world, you know, they became these tenements that have really uh, ghettoized people. We see that in the banlieues in Paris, you know, where, where there's been rioting in the last few years because people um, uh, uh, protest that kind of living conditions. Um, in California, for example, a lot of the uh, uh, public housing has actually, that, that was in the form of tall buildings, has been torn down because it alienates people and they have created little houses or two-story buildings that are, you know, in a way better or, you know, uh, for people. And, and here, you know, uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of this, this kind of dream uh, gone bad in a way. You know, the intention was good, but the result was, is, is not as good. And, and Carlos takes that and he adds this book um, from, written by Karl Mar Marx. And, and for many of us, you know, I mean, we don't, many of us don't even know who Karl Marx is or we've never read him because it's not something that is of interest or it's not part of our upbringing or education, but for Cubans, you know, they all know. You know, and, and, and they may not be interested uh, in it, but they all have Karl Marx in their home, so to speak, because they all have been raised on his philosophies and his books, and, 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 and it's, it's just part of Cuban life to a certain extent, maybe now less than before, but still quite present. So he utilizes the book also as a structure here in, 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 this, in this, and funny, he adds this book, and since I can't touch it, I don't know what it is, but it's the same title, but the name of the writer is not Karl Marx. You know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting that to make it more palatable, perhaps, to, uh, to the citizens, that they translate the name, they Hispanicize it, you know, so people would pronounce it better. <laughs> For one thing, they would remember better. Um, as I said, this, build, this uh, piece resembles uh, Ele Corbusier building. He's done another beautiful piece that resembles an Oscar Niemeyer building. And as, if, if you are familiar with Oscar Niemeyer, he's the, he's the architect who designed Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, uh, that was founded in the early 60s. And Oscar Niemeyer is a communist. He's always belonged to the Communist Party, but it's a very interesting case because in a way his life sort of parallels that of the Cuban artist. You know, he belongs to the Communist Party, but he's a very rich man, you know, with an incredible architectural practice. I think he's a hundred years old and he's still alive and supposedly working. And he has this beautiful studio in Copacabana in, 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 in Rio de Janeiro. And, um, and his status has opened doors and also closed doors. So Oscar Niemeyer, you know, for example, is not allowed in the United States. He can travel here. 
Um, there is a house in Beverly Hills in, in California which he designed long distance because he wasn't allowed to come and build it because of his communist affiliation. So the piece that Carlos made is made of cement blocks with books in it. And on one side it has the, um, it has the, the cathedral uh, in, in Brasilia. And it's interesting the combination of elements, the books, uh, uh, the concrete, which is very prevalent in contemporary architecture. But I think it also speaks about the tradition of concrete art in Brazil, you know, which is abstract art. Um, I would say non-referential abstract art. It's called concrete art. And in Brazil and Argentina and Venezuela, that was the name that was given to that kind of abstraction. And, and, and the church, you know, these, 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 these sort of, um, Third power, you know, um, that is very prevalent even for a communist, a church, the religion is very important. So again, you know, these many, many layered uh, works that Carlos makes, uh, some of them are very accessible. He always titles the works, which in a way I'm very grateful for because nowadays a lot of contemporary artists use the word untitled. And so for an art historian trying to remember, you know, what the work looks like with it, Untitled, it's almost impossible. But Carlos uses language, and in in in, in his um, very poetic uh, uh, titles, um, you can read a lot. You can start with the title and ex ex read a lot of meaning into the work, and 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 then add your own meaning, and and it sort of becomes this this um, kind of uh, fountain of of inspiration. Uh, um, that, that I think is, is so important, is very, and, and, and sort of also uh, helps in, in your engagement with, with the work. So um, I think this is what I have to say. I don't know if you have any questions. If I left something out or someone has a question, you know, yes. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you know how he became engaged in architecture or a friend in his period of yeah. uh, uh, artistic development that you so very nicely mm -hmm. give us a good view on. Yes, you know, it's interesting. Carlos, for a while, when he was, um, he was doing these beautiful architectural drawings, he was signing them, uh, Carlos Garaycoa, Proyectista. And Proyectista in Spanish means draftman. And I talked with him about that about five years ago because he was basically taking the persona of an architect. And I think that in a way that must have been inspired by the, um, by this, first of all, he grew up around Havana Vieja, which is this beautiful square in all Havana that has these amazing buildings. And they started a, a restoration process um, in Havana many years ago, and that's one of the squares that they restored early on. And one of the sad things about that was that they had to, um, all the people who lived in that neighborhood and who had grown up there, spent all their lives there, were actually uh, taken to other places to live. So when they were living in the center of the city and they were part of that fabric and they, they were aware of what was going on in the city all the time, as they were uh, transferred to other housing, they were taken to the suburbs and places where they felt lost, completely lost, you know, um, and, and isolated. And, and all those beautiful buildings were then renovated. Even the square, which used to be um, a certain style, what then in, at some point they excavated a parking lot. They had an underground parking lot and now with the renovation they have gotten rid of that and taken the plaza back to what it was before. And so Carlos grew up in that area so he was very aware of the architecture and then as buildings began to deteriorate and fall down, all that area looked like a post-war uh, place. I mean, uh, some of the drawings that he made in the early 90s are those of the photograph of the street with buildings propped up by wood beams, and then a drawing of what he imagined the street to be. And so I think that between that and also his walks throughout the city photographing the architecture, 
he began to really have, uh, to, to see himself as, as someone who could actually make changes. Uh, and perhaps not, not actual changes, because I think that uh, what he does is what I call utopian architecture. You know, it's, it's all his own dream, you know, of, of something that may never happen. And, and he has expressed that in, in different works. Uh, he made a work for my exhibition called Capablanca Real's, uh, Capablanca's Real Passion, which was a, a, a chess game. And uh, it, it was at a time in which the relationship between Cuba and the US were very, um, uh, were very um, kind of, um, well, it was during President Bush's time, so you know, artists were not getting visas, and, and, and there was a lot of tension between the US. And he picked that because uh, that was about power play. And it was about the US and Cuba. And uh, Capablanca was a phenomenal chess player who at some point defeated the US chess player. I cannot remember now, but there was a famous game in which Capablanca defeated this American chess player. And so for Cubans, you know, they took a great pride on that. And, and the chess, this chess game was really beautiful. First of all, the uh, table was not flat with the, with the way a chess is, uh, 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 but it, it had blocks of different heights. So it was a broken topography. To start, and you could change it. You could move it around and, and change the topography of it. And also, he talked about the difficulty of not walking on a flat terrain, you know, and, and you can take that in different directions, you know. Uh, politically, you are never walking on a flat terrain, you know. Cubans are never walking on a flat terrain because things change every day. They have to read the paper to know what's going on because the paper tells them of changes that the government is making. And, and so this, this idea of the unknown or the unexpected they have to live with. And then he had the, the two sides were represented, one by archetypal buildings. So you could see the capital, which oh, he said is the Havana capital, but the Havana capital is a, it's a replica of the US Capitol building. Um, a Renaissance church, an Italian palazzo, and the other was a series of buildings that he just invented. He just, uh, in this kind of uh, new persona that he had taken as an architect, he was building um, these, these fantastic buildings all out of his own imagination, not knowing if they could ever be built, you know. But in a way, I think that um, the way architecture has played a role in the life of Cubans is something that in, perhaps played an important uh, part in, in, in him focusing on that aspect. You know, it's, it's a subject that he's taken to, to levels that I never imagined. And, um, you know, from the very beginning, I couldn't have told. Um, so it's, and it's something that you have to live with every day because architecture changes there tremendously. Here, for example, in our cities, uh, it changes uh, not necessarily for the better, but most of the changes are about new buildings, new buildings being built. And so the, the landscape changes regularly, but it's about the new and supposedly the better. Uh, but in Havana, it's not like that. In Havana, it sort of changes for the worse, um, unfortunately, you know, because um, it's gotten to the point that you just can't um, fix anything soon enough. So you fix what you can. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very no. much. No, you're welcome.